Recording has been started. Good morning to our viewers in United States and good evening to our distinguished speaker as well as guests from India. We are here under the platform of Council for Strategic Affairs for our distinguished lecture series. My name is Dr. Adityanji, and I'm the president of Council for Strategic Affairs. We have this session once a month. Those of you who registered themselves probably saw this flyer of ours. Topic for today's distinguished lecture is India's quest for maritime capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region. And our distinguished speaker is Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. And just to be on record, today is Saturday, September 24th, 2022, and it's 10 a.m. in New York and 7.30 p.m. in India. I'll give you a brief introduction to the Council for Strategic Affairs. Council for Strategic Affairs imparts education in the field of international relations. The Council fosters discussion, dialogue, and debate on geopolitical issues. CSA encourages strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness. CSA unequivocally condemns terrorism in all its forms worldwide. And CSA aims to contribute towards world peace and prosperity. We have several events that regularly take place. We have a monthly roundtable discussion that happens on second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime. We have a monthly distinguished guest lecture by a domain expert on fourth Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime. The Council organizes symposia, meetings, and conferences. It promotes publications of articles on geopolitics, politics, and related subjects. And we do have a summer internship program for college students, if anyone is interested. And you are soon going to see our distinguished speaker for today, Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. I'll give you a brief introduction because he does not need introduction. Admiral Pradeep Chauhan is currently the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation of India, based in New Delhi is India's foremost resource center for the development and advocacy of strategies for promotion and protection of countries' maritime interests. Admiral Chauhan has had a very distinguished, rich, and varied four-decade-long career in the Indian Navy. That has included, amongst other things, prestigious tenures at the sea and ashore. He was the commander of India's sole aircraft carrier at that time, the INS Virat, and commander of Indian Navy's state-of-the-art officer training academy in Kerala. He has been honored three times by the President of India for sustained excellence of his service. Admiral enjoys international renown as an incisive strategic analyst and is prolific writer on maritime and strategic issues with more than 95 published articles and research papers to his credit. He's also much sought after leadership mentor in India and abroad and invited for conferences, symposia. And I'm very proud to say that Council for Strategic Affairs is delighted to host him for second time on a distinguished oration. And not only us, I picked it up. The topic is very close to his heart. It is another actually conference where he was invited, so you see his picture. Before I hand over the platform to him, I'll give a little bit of introduction. A good Navy is not a provocation to war. It is the surest guarantee of peace, so said Theodore Roosevelt. 
when we talk about India's maritime interest, usually we have looked into Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and Indian Ocean. That has been the traditional, you know, sphere of influence for India's naval forces and things like that. So that is a gain. But if you look at Indo-Pacific region, it's much larger, much wider. Again, a picture of Indo-Pacific region, map of the Indo-Pacific. So this is the challenge we face at this point in time. Indo-Pacific is one of the most dynamic regions of the world today. Formidable long-term security challenges remain in this region, and the policy planners must think strategically to increase the capacity for a favorable balance of power as maintaining regional stability is a priority for India. India should acquire and develop a true BWN instead of remaining a green navy. Of course, we are working in that direction. This is the new insignia. A lot of you might have seen this picture when Prime Minister launch INS Vikrant. That's the picture and that's the other older INS Vikramaditya. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over the platform to Admiral Vice Chauhan, uh, uh, Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. A few housekeeping rules. I would like everyone to mute themselves to avoid noise interference, and I'll do that myself as soon as I hand it over to Admiral Johan. Change your cell phone setting to vibration mode. Please, please do not interrupt our distinguished speaker when he is speaking. Only those members of the audience who identify themselves openly will be allowed to pose questions. No anonymous questioners. All the questions will be moderated through the chat function. You have to be very precise and specific in asking a question. Please don't send detailed comments in the form of a lecture or monologue. Just ask a simple, precise question. And lastly, this program is being recorded. It will be available on our website uh, and our YouTube channel so people can see it later on. And without further ado, I invite Admiral Pradeep Chauhan for his distinguished oration. You're welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adityanji, and thank you for uh, thank you to the CSA for giving me multiple opportunities uh, to address uh, subjects which are, I believe, uh, particularly relevant to all of us who either are Indians or who understand where India is coming from and where it needs to go. Uh, I'm going to um, share my presentation now. And put it to full screen so that you can see it. Just give me a thumbs up if that's, uh, or, or just say yes or no, whether it's visible. Uh, Dr. Adityanji, is that clear? It is visible, sir. All right. Thank All right. you so much. And uh, without further ado, let me commence uh, this particular talk on India's quest for maritime capabilities in the Indo-Pacific. Um, You know, all too often in our planning, in our analysis, in our discussions, we tend to place geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geostrategy in the same horizontal typological plane. And then we ask ourselves with somewhat baited, uh, breathless voices, uh, I say this uh, BRI or this AUKUS, is it geopolitical? Is it a geoeconomic thing? Is it a geostrategic thing? And uh, we uh, generally tend to get ourselves completely confused about this. The truth, of course, in the subject is that, um, let me just try and get my slides going, is that this is conceptually completely incorrect. The truth is that every country 
has a set of geoeconomic goals and it has another set of non-geoeconomic goals. And then uh, it devises or develops, formulates geostrategies for the attainment of these geo economic goals and other geo strategies for the attainment of non geo economic goals and india is no exception to this after it has done that it, that means after it has created its geo strategy it must seek to put in place a set of assurance and insurance mechanisms assurance mechanisms which will assure you that your strategy will work and insurance mechanisms that will ensure you against any untoward uh, or unforeseen slippage in the manner in which your geo strategy was intended to unfold. Now, these could be brittle, that brittle ones are interpersonal relations between political leaders, and they are brittle because, inter because po uh, political leaders tend to either move out of office or uh, sometimes they have worse things happen to them. Uh, and more enduring ones are the instruments of a nation's foreign policy. A nation has only two instruments of its foreign policy, diplomacy, and the military. And we do not include economics as an instrument of foreign policy, simply because economics is the goal. And therefore, hardly can, it can hardly be the means as well. So all this caboodle put together is then called geopolitics. And that having been said, what I would like to concentrate upon today is this business of assurance and insurance mechanisms. And within them, I want to talk to you more about the military. So when we talk about military maritime security, we want to, uh, we, we are confronted with this question that how, ha what has changed? How has, how have we changed in this current Modi era? Well, I want to be quite clear conceptually. Now we are far more clear than we were before. Attitudinally, we are far more confident than we are before. And most importantly, we are now finally playing to our strengths and are prioritizing capability over capacity, where capacity is simply material wherewithal, uh, boats, submarine, aircraft, ship, um, whereas capability uh, is the human wherewithal, the human uh, ingenuity, genius that will actually maximize your cap capacity. Now, there is a continuous uh, and completely wrong uh, belief that technology today equals victory. And I would like you to just look at India's own track record. In 1965, in the conflict against Pakistan, uh, India's Air Force was flying uh, Nats. Pakistan's Air Force were flying Sabre Jets. The Sabre Jet was two or three generations ahead of, uh, of uh, the Nat. And yet, the, the country that used inferior technology, namely India, did not end up on the losing side. In 1971, Again, against Pakistan, Indian Army was deploying Centurion tanks and a few T-71s, whereas the Pakistanis were deploying Patton tanks, significantly uh, technologically superior to us, and yet uh, they didn't win, we did. And if you look at Israel, which is often talked about as the example for high technology, uh, once again, I would request you to look at Israel between 1948 and 1973, when Israel was, in fact, the weaker technological power, all seven armies of, each, uh, of the Arab states that had been arrayed against Israel were armed to the teeth by the highest technology available at that time and provided by the Soviet Union. And yet, it was Israel which came out victors. So therefore, it is a, it is a chimera to chase after technology, believing that technology will, in fact, be synonymous with victory. Now, what else has changed? In about 2004 or eight, we were, as a Navy, we had 35% only of our ships that were blue water capable. I want to hasten to add that we are not a green water Navy. We are a true blue water Navy and have been one for some time. Now, blue water is waters which extend beyond your exclusive economic zone and where you can deploy at length. It is not the same to be a blue water Navy as it's to be a global Navy. Those are two different things. But coming back to my slide, uh, at that period, we had only 35% of blue water ships and 65% were brown water ships. And today, after the present administration, we have 
exactly reversed that ratio. Today, we have 65% of the Indian Navy with blue water capability and only 35% left with brown water. And if you look at this orbit of the Indian Navy, it's quite impressive. We are today, having started off with only 33 ships at the time of Indian independence, we are today standing at a Navy of over 100 frontline combatants with about 68 of them currently building. Uh, similar is the case with the submarine arm and also with aviation. The question that now needs to be asked is why? Why Why are we doing all this? Why is India investing all this stuff? Why? Uh, in other words, why do we have a Navy? And the answer to that, of course, is because India wishes to use the seas in ways uh, that are to her advantage for her own purposes, while preventing or dissuading or deterring other people from using the seas in ways that are to India's disadvantage. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, please remember that the next two centuries will be, in fact, centuries of the sea. And over the course of these two centuries, India will either be a maritime power or India will not be any kind of power at all. Therefore, the present obsession with the trans Himalayan border area is transient, and the country must now learn to dance with increasing adroitness, adeptness, skill over the maritime domain, and only that will give it the requisite international standing and power. Now, the ability to use the seas, that ability that I spoke about for one's own purposes while dissuading, deterring, or preventing other people from using them in ways that are to our disadvantage constitutes any country's maritime power. And maritime power has a military, political, and economic power exerted through the ability to use the seas. Insofar as we are concerned, before we turn to the Indo-Pacific, it is important to recognize that our national maritime policy is in fact quite comprehensively structured with a balance being struck between the blue economy, which is not how much can the oceans contribute to the Indian economy, but how blue is the Indian economy? That all that constitutes holistic maritime security. And the other segment is hard maritime security, which is going to be the subject of our talk today. Both these pillars must rest upon a legal framework in which national or municipal law is properly reconciled with duly, international, duly ratified international law. And this is one of the largest weaknesses, not only in India, but in very many countries of the world. Because of this lack of reconciliation between national and international law, duly ratified international law, there is a lack of integration of maritime stakeholder activities. Let me contextualize all this to India. For India, what is our desired end state? Our desired end state is to assure the economic, the material, and the societal well-being of the people of India. And I dare say you cannot, you will not be able to arrive at a more fundamental core national interest of India. And this derives from the Constitution of India in the section dealing with uh, directives of state policy. Now, insofar as the articulation, once a desired end state is articulated, then that articulation becomes known as a statement of policy. And in India's case, mar our maritime policy is, of course, SAGAR, uh, act encapsulated by the acronym SAGAR, standing for security and growth for all in the region. This is a diagrammatic depiction of SAGAR. It represents India's dime, our diplomatic, our informational, our military, our economic outreach throughout the region of what we now call the Indo-Pacific. Then that brings us to what on earth is India's principal maritime interest. And as I said, our principal maritime interest is holistic maritime security. That is freedom from threats arising in the sea or through the sea or from the sea. And this is not a statement made by me or by the National Maritime Foundation. This is a statement made by the Prime Minister of India and Prime Ministerial statements, as you very well know, are not deniable. So freedom from threats arising from man-made threats or natural threats or combinations of threats, all this, when you are free of all this, you have maritime security. Man-made threats could incorporate geopolitic, geopolitical constriction or indeed state-on-state -state conflict, 
the rest of them you are well familiar with, and I do not need to dwell upon them any further. What is the geographical context then? The geographical context within which all this occurs is the Indo-Pacific. This is a predominantly, but I hasten to add, it is not an exclusively maritime space. Our concept of the Indo-Pacific has been enunciated clearly enough by the Prime Minister of India, and he says that it extends from the shore of East Africa to the shores of the American continent. And therefore, that brings us to what are our objectives in the maritime domain. And these are not formally promulgated by the government of India, but therefore they are derived because the government of India does not yet uh, promulgate any white paper. And so these are open to some debate, of course. There are eight formal objectives, protection from sea-based threats to India's territorial integrity, stability, peace and prosperity in India's maritime neighborhood, the creation, development and sustenance of a blue economy that is resilient against the adverse maritime effects of climate change, the preservation, the promotion, the pursuit, the protection of offshore infrastructure and maritime resources, both within our maritime zones and beyond, the promotion, protection, and safety of our overseas and our coastal seaborne trade, as well as our sea lines of communication, and the ports that constitute the nodes of this trade, support to marine scientific research, including that in Antarctica and the Arctic, because when we examine the Antarctic correctly, we are able to correctly predict the Indian monsoon. When we get the Indian monsoon right, we get our agriculture right. When we get our agriculture right, we get our economy right. And when we get our economy right, India stands to be a power. Seventh is the provision of support, succor, and extrication option to the Indian diaspora. And eighth, last but not the least, is the obtaining and retaining of a favorable geostrategic maritime position. And with that, eight having been identified, it is time for us to turn to India's strategies. India's grand strategy, her military strategy, and her maritime strategy are all increasingly being contextualized to the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific, ladies and gentlemen, is therefore our strategic geography. Now I've introduced a new word. What on earth is this new thing called strategic geography? And how does strategic geography differ from real geography? Well, the truth is that if you take a map or a chart, and on that map or chart, you put a series of latitudes and longitudes, and then you join these latitudes and longitudes by a line, which then encompasses a given area. And if in that area you concentrate much of your grand strategy, then the area that has been encompassed is your strategic geography. Clearly, the strategic geography of one state won't be the same as the, that of the other, Tonga's strategic geography won't be the same as that of India. India's will not be the same as that of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's will not be the same as that of Russia. Russia's will not be the same as that of Iceland, and so on and so forth. Now, as a sovereign power, the name we have given to our strategic geography is the Indo-Pacific. And there's nothing remarkable or nothing to be worried about uh, in the fact that some other nation might give its, its strategic geography the same name. Uh, there are very many people called Arun Kumar Singh, and it is nobody's case that every Arun Kumar Singh should be identical to every other Arun Kumar Singh simply because their name happens to be Arun Kumar Singh. And yet, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, if we have this big problem about why is our Indo-Pacific not the same as his Indo-Pacific, and the whole thing is an, is an exercise in futility undertaken largely by people who have little else to do. The Indo-Pacific constructs of Japan, ASEAN, the EU, the Netherlands, France, and Germany now coincide with that of India in that they include the entire region which is shaped by the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. Remember, the Indo-Pacific is about oceans and not about countries. And while that of Australia and the USA do not presently go west of India, there is increasing evidence of strategic convergence. And that strategic convergence is not only about shared interests, which could be transactional, but also about values, ideas, and norms across a number of policy fields. And that, the number of policy fields and the depth of our strategic convergence across them, that gives rise to a new thing. And that new thing is strategic partnerships, which are gaining traction as an alternative 
to the treaty alliances of the Cold War period. In the Indo-Pacific, the USA's defense treaty allies are well known. Japan, South Korea, Thailand, Philippines, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. But now we have a new setup, a new hierarchy. So we have strategic partnerships. We have special strategic partnerships. We have comprehensive strategic partnerships, strategic and global partnerships, comprehensive global strategic partnerships, comprehensive special strategic partnerships, and so on and so forth. Now, no matter, however, where different countries position the spatial boundaries of their area of interest, the Indo-Pacific remains, as I said, a predominantly but not exclusively maritime expanse. And insofar as India is concerned, we must now contend with two Indias of equal size. One continental India with a land area of 3.2 million square kilometers and the other a maritime India with an area of 3.2 million square kilometers. So India's challenge will always remain how to achieve the right balance between our land-based geopolitical imperatives and our maritime geopolitical imperatives. This question of balance is a question that every large nation wrestles with, and India is no exception to that. Let me give you some examples of why the Indo-Pacific is so critical to us. Let's look at the challenges of external merchandise trade. Now, India's trade, 90% by volume, 65% uh, by value of India's trade moves by sea. And so to all intents and purposes, India is an island nation. Great. But how much is 90%? 90% of one is only 0.9. So what is, the, what is the amount? This is percentage. You can play many tricks with percentage. So let me show you the openness index of uh, some, some selected countries. Openness index is the same as merchandise trade to GDP ratio, which is import plus export divided by GDP. It shows you how open we are, how open we are to shocks in the international uh, arena. And if you look at India, we are, despite four years of economic slowdown, and this year is a particularly bad one, we still have a decadal average of 34% almost of India's GDP being accounted for by external merchandise trade, not services, because services don't go by sea or air or anything. Just merchandise trade. We have a value which is considerably higher than if you look at the United States, which is about the correct value, about 20, 22%, which means that it is strongly driven by domestic growth and domestic drivers of the economy, plus a good balance with external. Our external exposure is much higher. If you look at our top 10 merchandise imports, then obviously you'll know that crude oil is our biggest, largest, most voluminous, most valuable import item, and it outstrips everything else by an order of magnitude. And if you look at the top 10 import sources of all Indian trade, then you will obviously see that China uh, is our number one trading partner, and this is, leads us to this piquant situation where our number one trading partner is also our most likely enemy. If you look at India's oil imports, you will see that 65% of India's oil imports, and these are almost 5.46% million barrels of oil per day coming only from West Asia, 65%. So consequently, the Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Bab el Mandeb are linchpins for Asian, not just Indian, Asian, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, South Korean economic well-being. And if you look at the Strait of Bab el Mandeb in the Mozambique Channel, that too becomes critical for India as India picks up oil from either the United States or from South American countries such as Venezuela. I will talk about natural gas in a moment and that will also emphasize the importance of the Mozambique channel. But let me come to India's petroleum first. That means as a refining power, India is the fourth largest refiner on the planet Earth. Therefore, while our largest import is crude oil, our largest export is petroleum products. So, as they say, we are into oil, whether it is import, whether it is export. Our concentration is on oil, and oil moves by sea. What about natural gas? If you take natural gas, we had 65% dependence upon West Asia there. Here we have 73.5% import dependence upon West Asia, and in particular upon Qatar. 42% of our gas is coming there. Clearly, therefore, 
If we look at overall trade, forget about only looking at natural gas and only looking at petroleum products and petroleum crude. Let's look at the changing direction of our external trade per se. Today, we have trade burgeoning with South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, some, uh, uh, you know, Oman. But which is our largest, which is the country, do you know, which is our second largest export partner on the planet Earth? Not in some area or some region on the planet Earth. It is the UAE. Therefore, what happens in the UAE affects India deeply. And that means that the criticality for India of the Strait of Hormuz is not limited to oil and gas bearing shipping alone. We are in panic because our containers have to go to Jebel Ali, they have to go to Khalifa, they have to go to these huge container terminals, and they need to therefore go into the Persian Gulf via the Strait of Hormuz. Consequently, India is forever looking more and more desperately, and so is the Indian Navy, at ports that lie outside of the state of Hormuz. So we are concerned, and we become these become household names with the maritime thinkers of India, which are few, unfortunately. Uh, Khorfa Khan and, 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 and Sohar and Sultan Qaboos and Dukkum and Salala, Nishtun, Mukalla, Aden, all these are ports which are as important for Indians to remember today, whether they are Army, Navy, Air Force, civilian, scientists, engineers, and analysts, as Demchok and Depsang and Dalit Beg Oldi and, and, and Galwan and, and, and all of those. These are new. This is in the new India, and it must look at all of these equally. If you look at the Strait of Babel Monday, 50 billion, five zero billion dollars worth of imports and six zero billion dollars worth of exports flows every year. Indian goods, Indian goods via the Strait of Hormuz, via the Strait of Gulf of, via the Strait of Babel Monday and through the Gulf of Aden. Do you think that 110 billion dollars worth of goods is big money or small money? Big money. Therefore, if you look at People, if I listen to people who say, Tum apne mein kyun nahi rehte? why don't you just look at the Indian Ocean? I want to ask them, what have you been smoking, guys? Look at what is happening when $110 billion is affected. We react. When we look at the South China Sea, 25% of India's overseas merchandise trade, $190 billion, exports and imports, flows through the South China Sea. This excludes, does not include, our trade with Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, those countries are Indian Ocean countries. Wow. And then, should we not be interested in this area? Why would we be interested in 110? Why would we not be interested, therefore, in 190? Consequently, we look at countries around our region, with, within our region and around our, within our neighborhood with different eyes than just looking at everything from the eyes of SARC. So the criticality of Indonesia is marked. Indonesia sits astride every single one of the choke points that connect the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Malacca, Sunda, Lombok. And when I talk to you, and I talk to even Indian audiences, and I say, Ombai Wetar, they say, same to you. Same to you? What does that mean, same to you? Do you know that Ombai Wetar Strait is the only strait through which submerged nuclear-powered submarines can transit between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean while remaining underwater. Those are Indian submarines, yep. Chinese submarines, yep. US submarines, yep. French, yes. British, yes. Any Russian, yes. Anybody who has a large nuclear powered submarine, leave aside a nuclear capable, weapon capable submarine, must use the Ombai Weta Strait for underwater transit. So when we meet an Indonesian, we must tell them, I tell everybody I meet, when you meet an Indonesian, just say, I'll marry you. You worry about his gender later on. First, they are that important to us. So let me turn to India's maritime strategies. In indicative terms, our strategy in times of peace is specifically one of constructive engagement. India is currently concentrating upon two very different but major approaches for its endeavors vis-a-vis -vis constructive engagement. The first is the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, or the IPOI. The IPOI is not some grand plan of India's. It is 
saying, India saying to the region that, hi, look, we have all these problems. Does anybody want to have any idea? Anybody wants to take charge? Anybody wants to lead? We will be able to follow. We can support. We can lead. And so you have maritime security, ecology, science, technology, academic cooperation. Science and technology and academic cooperation should not be hostage to STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Because we need to be informed by the social sciences. We need to be informed by the life sciences. We need to be informed by the humanities. Then there's disaster risk reduction, there's capacity building, capability, enhancement, trade connectivity, and maritime resources, and their sustainable harvesting. So the second of them, of course, time does not permit me to dwell upon any of them, but the second of them is the Quad. There are, of course, a number of other strategic constructs which bear upon our own strategies, and they are, they are explained by this rather complicated looking uh, Venn diagram of the Indian Ocean area, and the most inclusive structure you will see is the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, or IONS, which was set up in February of 2008 and, con and coordinates, consolidates all 38 countries, navies, or maritime security agencies of the Indian Ocean. We, as a navy, we, as a maritime power, we, as a country, recognize today that Africa matters more than ever. It's a billion people with the youngest populace globally. It's growing politically, it's growing economically. It has enormous proven reserves of everything. And so African security architectures are no longer something that we can leave to some esoteric development by, by some academic or some uh, institution. These are real. We are deeply involved as a country, as a maritime power, and as a Navy in each of these architectural constructs, whether they are the Djibouti Code of Conduct or they are the CPAR uh, for Africa Symposium, or for that matter, they are the 2050 African Integrated Maritime Strategy. Let me touch upon AUKUS. I know you've had a longish uh, conversation about AUKUS, but AUKUS is a structure. And AUKUS needs to be understood by all of us when we are talking about the Indo-Pacific. So we know that we, you all know about AUKUS and it's, uh, it's um, its inception in, on the 15th of September of 2021. But I want you to remember that AUKUS has two lines of effort. One is the highly publicized one of submarines. So yeah, AUKUS will provide Australia with conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines. Yeah, it will take some two decades or more. But the second line of effort is much more important to countries such as India, and that is the advanced capabilities and their development. So AUKUS will develop and provide joint advanced military capabilities to promote security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. What does that mean? Well, I think that that means that what we're looking at will be always uh, a set of technologies which, whose implementation currently is in progress and we need to watch it. So I'm not going to worry about how many meetings have been held by how many senior officers group or the joint steering group. I want to go straight on to, uh, to the fact that Line of effort number one is problematic. This is the Virginia class submarine, which is presumably what the US is offering, and there are huge technological problems with this submarine. These are issues which are being developed in that line of effort with regard to submarines. Of consequence is the new submarine base and also the new nuclear part submarine construction yard, which are coming up in Australia. But the one I wanted to talk to you about is line of effort number two, which is advanced capabilities. Here, there's lots of room for, for, for interaction, lots of room for inclusion, and very little room for exclusion. Undersea capabilities, quantum technologies, AI and autonomy in contested environments, advanced offensive and defensive cyber capabilities, hypersonic, counter hypersonic capabilities, EW, uh, innovation, information sharing. There are, as I said, some apprehensions, there's quite a lot of nervousness, and it, that is all considered to be normal. So what, what is the uh, quad adversely uh, impacted by AUKUS? Yes, no. I think that the answer is that Biden's promise, uh, you know, the answer is that, uh, uh, that, that uh, AUKUS actually frees the quad. How should we best, gentlemen, how should we best handle China? We can handle China best by making sure that our region is so well stitched, knitted together that we do not give any space, any fissure, any gap.
for China to make a strategic entry. That is how you do this. And if Quad can achieve that, then AUKUS and Quad will work in harmony. So if you look at India, India has signed all the U.S. foundational agreements now, the GSOMIA, the COMCASA, the LIMOA, the BECA. It has taken us a long time to do this, but we are there. These are enabling instruments. They don't force you to do anything, but without them, you can do nothing. So should India worry or India should sulk at being excluded from AUKUS? Is that what we should be doing? Actually, since the AUKUS alliance has caused anger in France and in the EU, actually it's not even an alliance, the AUKUS is a partnership. Does this provide or does this not provide India with greater strategic autonomy? And so is India-France relationship, for example, not likely to improve by leaps and bounds for our technology needs, we can now turn to France, Germany, Japan, while continuing to maintain ties with Australia, the UK and the US. That is exactly what is meant by strategic autonomy. So when we had recently the second India, Japan two plus two meet, we found that, hello, now Japan is keen to say, would you, are you interested in the Sodio two class submarine? Are you interested in advanced batteries? We saying yes, 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 but we don't want to buy. We want to jointly develop. We want joint development. We understand that nobody will sell you, nobody will give you, nobody will gift you technology just because you happen to be Indian with a large market. Why should I give you technology? Why should I make you a, part, a competitor of mine? However, we are trying to say, let's sit and jointly develop technology. We are saying we may not have such high capacity. Capacity is material wherewithal. You don't have a patrol boat. I give you a patrol boat. I have doubled your capacity. Capacity is boat, craft, submarine, all that sort of thing. Capability. Capability is what we do have. Capability is human ingenuity, as I said. So. You have doubled your capacity because I gave you your patrol craft. Now, do you have? Uh, do you know how to deploy it? Do you have a life cycle costing for it? Do you have a training infrastructure? Do you have a legal framework? Do you have a, a operation come maintenance cycle? Yes, 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 and yes. Wow, you have capability. No, 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 and no. Maybe you only have a liability, and therefore India is looking to capitalize upon capability. So finally, what has AUKUS bought us? AUKUS has bought us additional time vis-a-vis -vis China. The question is, the question is, what are you doing with the time that you bought? And therefore, when we talk about dealing with China, like every other country, India's strategy is informed by an ongoing assessment of present and future risk in our region. And like I wanted to, I often say, we have seven major risks in our region, one for each day of the week. And China figures too frequently, too disconcertingly in too many of them. And therefore, when we talk about conflict considerations, all you wise and erudite gentlemen must recognize that two armies don't go to war, two navies don't go to war, two air forces don't go to war, two nations go to war. And so the question that arises is what are the various combinations of circumstances or happenstances that would convince the government of India that we are not engaged in some army army skirmish? This is not some air land battle or land air battle, but the Republic of India is in a state of armed conflict with the People's Republic of China and or the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. What are those combination of circumstances? Suppose you're a dove. Suppose you're a dove and you don't want war, then you must know the answer so that you can avoid such a combination. Suppose you're a hawk and you want war. OK, then you must know the answer so that you can engineer these circumstances. But if you don't know the answer, you will simply blunder into war. And this the Indian Navy and the Indian country nation is clear that it cannot afford to do. So when we talk about military maritime missions, before we talk about even mentioning them, I want you to understand and all people to understand that unlike land warfare, naval warfare is inherently expeditionary. Navies do not fight only in waters that are adjacent to us or proximate to their homelands. The enemy's warships, the enemy's overseas bases, the enemy's commerce are legitimate targets wherever they may be. 
So what are our missions as a Navy? Yeah, we do dissuasion, we do deterrence, we do secret. Dissuasion is not the same as deterrence. In dissuasion, I, did, I discourage you from acquiring the means to do something. In deterrence, I fail to discourage you from acquiring the means. I now discourage you from using the means. That's the difference between dissuasion and deterrence. And we have missions for each. We have sea control missions, sea denial missions, what the Americans like to call A to AD. We have trade warfare missions, interdictions, and so on and so forth. Now the Bombay question. The Bombay question is always this. If we were to be nicer to China, yeah, would China be nicer to us? And the truth is that China's historical concept of being the middle kingdom surrounded by barbarian states whose sole raison d'etre is to pay obeisance and thus and tribute to China. This provides contemporary China with a defining sense of national identity. And therefore, the apparent lack of any pushback against China's incrementally expanding claims over geographical areas does not generate anything except disdain in the Chinese mind, because that's the behavior expected of vassals. China, China is quite a lot like in Game of Thrones. China is like Queen Cersei. China looks at you and says, what is, you, what is, your, what, what is your role in life? And you, uh, you say, I'm not Chinese. Ah, therefore, you are a vassal state and your job is to uh, supplicate. You're a supplicant. You please supplicate. What does that have to do with me? My job is to knock your head off. This I will do from time to time. So could China then leave the Indian Ocean alone and remain satisfied with being the predominant power in the South and East China Seas? Is that possible? What is it? What is it, Admiral Chauhan? What is it other than your fevered imagination that indicates that what is it that compels China to operate in the Indian Ocean region? For this, you must understand the core national interests of China. And one of those core national interests is domestic stability, unlike India, China has all these problems. Fear of large-scale internal unrest and political uprising due to loss of economic prosperity or food scarcity. Lack of any venting mechanism amongst the people resulting from the party's inability to tolerate dissent. Inability to handle societal tensions arising from inequalities and distribution of wealth. And people tell me, excuse me, where are you coming from, baby? Have you seen India's inequality of distribution of wealth? And yes, the answer is yes, we have more inequality. But we have two things going for us. Number one, we can vent. We vent all the time. We are on the streets all the time. And therefore, we do not build up a pressure cooker situation. The second, kismat. We are believers in kismat. Doi roti likhi thi hamare kismat mein agar teen likhi hoti to teen milti. Both these put together are issues that support India, provide advantage to India, and provide disadvantage to China. Then there's the centrality of and sensitivity to face Western Europe, America, and, and Great Britain, etc., have no concept of face. They have no idea about what face is. They think face is honor. They think face is respect. We also don't have any concept of face. China has a concept of face. Japan has a concept of face. South Korea face therefore a nation which has a great deal of store that it lays by face should never make the strategic mistake of giving some date by which it will become great so when china says we will become the number one numero uno honcho in 2049 maybe that's only 27 years from now and there is no westphalian state that has become the global hegemon without simultaneously being the maritime hegemon and therefore, China will have to best or better the combined maritime power of the United States, of Europe, of uh, India, of Australia, of France, of Vietnam, of Singapore. Wow. And as the years go by, they will start to make mistakes. Our trick will be our trick will be in the Indo-Pacific. How do we recognize what is a mistake? You know, this business of giving dates is really problematic for uh, China because in India, the late President Abdul Kalam said, in 2020, India, super power, bang, bang. 2020 came and 2020 went, we never became a super power. So what did Indians do? Did they all hang themselves from the nearest fan? Did we commit ritual harakiri? No, we said 2020, no, 3020. In India, there's no face attached to this. In China, there is. Second. Look at this 15-inch ISO Hyatt. 
The 15 inch ISO height, ladies and gentlemen, is a line joining place. An ISO height is a line joining places of equal rainfall. You need 15 inches of rainfall to be able to support an agricultural economy, no matter who you are, where you are. This is China's 15 inch ISO height, and you will see that all the Han Chinese live south or east of this particular ISO height, and their per capita income here is between 15 and 50% higher than the mean. But all the belts are running north and west of that. Where is the purchasing power going to come from? So currently, if you look at China's suitability for rain fed and irrigated cereal production, this brings out the 15 inch ISO height even more graphically. Currently, China is in big trouble. It is on the verge of a major food shortage, triggering a strategic contest over food security. COVID-19 induced disruptions, catastrophic flooding in the Yangtze River Basin, three huge typhoons, locust swarms, fall army worm infestations. In other words, China's ability to drive its economy domestically is duck zero. And therefore, as the engine of China's economic growth demands ever greater resources of raw materials and petroleum-based energy, China has no option but to rely increasingly upon merchandise trade. 90% in our case and 90% in their case, which is seaborne. But in their case, 50% trans travels across the Indian Ocean, either bound for destinations in the Indian Ocean or for Europe or for the east coast of the United States. Let's look at the, some arithmetic. China's GDP, 18 trillion nominal in 2021, total merchandise trade, $6 trillion, 90% of this is seaborne, 5.4 trillion. You're living in Beijing. You're not sitting in the USA and India, in India listening to me. You're, you're sitting in Beijing. You are going to be panic stricken. You will not sleep at night. So is China's operational center of gravity actually China's merchandise maritime trade is a question. How does it look? How does it look to us? Sitting here, how does it look? This is how it looks. Uh, I hope that scares you. It certainly scares us. So is China plotting to surround India? The answer is no, 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 no. Is India getting surrounded? The answer is yes, 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 and yes. So it's quite a lot like the like a like a melon and the knife. Whether the melon hits the knife or the knife hits the melon, both times is bad for the melon. We are the melon. And therefore, India and its Navy is continuously deployed in mission-based deployments 24-7, 365 days in a year. Today, Western Naval Command's major surface combatants are at sea for 300 or 365 days in a year. We certainly need social networks. What about in times of tension? In times of tension, our concentration is upon the strategy of distraction. Preventing the eye of Sauron from focusing solely upon the Indian Ocean. So for us, the South China Sea must simmer, but it must not boil over. For us, the Taiwan crisis must keep Beijing preoccupied, but an actual invasion must not occur from either desperation or miscalculation. For us, Japan and China must continue to squabble about the Xinxiao gas fields. For us, we must encourage Japan to contain China in the East China Sea. Ishigaki Island getting M12 missiles for us is good news. For the Chinese East uh, Sea Fleet, which is, sent, which is headquartered at Ningbo, this is really bad news. They can't get out. Therefore, the East Sea Fleet cannot combine with the South China Sea Fleet, with the South Sea Fleet. For us, the USA must remain militarily engaged in the Western and Southern Pacific. For us, AUKUS must be played up so that it continues to engage China's attention. And finally, when the pen is not mighty enough, then India is and must be capable of unsheathing the sword. And then that leads us to the strategies of conflict. And it is certainly not my intention today to be able to talk about our strategies of conflict, but another time, another place, perhaps. I will stop here saying thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you found it my understanding. So last slide, where, last slide, where, 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 where would Pakistan want us to fight? Just put your mic to mute for one more minute. Where does Pakistan want us to fight? Pakistan wants us to fight in the area which is up there in the north where their shore-based fighter aircraft can support their fleet. Where do we want to fight? We want to fight here outside. 
Where does China want us to fight? China wants us to fight in the Bay of Bengal. China wants us to fight in the South China Sea. Where do we want to fight? We want to fight here. So we need to tell China, we need to find strategies by which we will make China abandon its military prudence and come to our killing ground. There is no point in India opening its buttons, spreading its chest, 52 inch or otherwise, and then deciding that it wants to go to South China Sea into the Chinese killing ground. That would be stupid beyond belief. And therefore, we will be forgiven for many things. One thing we cannot afford to be guilty of is failures of imagination. And that really brings me, uh, I think, to the last end of my slide. So thank you very much. I will now stop sharing. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Admiral Chauhan. What a lucid vision clarity of strategic thought. This is the first time I am encountered somebody speaking with passion for India, strategic clarity, and on behalf of all our audience, since we are in the virtual realm, I'm going to do three claps for you, sir. <laughs> that was a very impressive lecture, and I must say that it served this purpose for our audience, and now we will go on to question and answer session. As I said, all the questions are moderated. So the first one is basically a request. Can we please get the presentation and recording of this session? Yes, we do have recording of this session that will become available on the Council for Strategic Affairs YouTube channel. Having said that, the presentation is the intellectual property of Admiral Chauhan, and I will leave for him, if he wants to give some kind of, uh, you know, uh, a version of his PowerPoint presentation that cannot be altered or cannot be misused, that is for Admiral Chauhan to decide, and we can later on place it as part of our, you know, video recording or something like that. Admiral Chauhan. Well, uh, well, I don't, uh, have, I any don't have any quarrel, but I must tell you that, as you very well, well know, Dr. Well 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 Yanji, I, 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 uh, I'm one of those rare at who makes all the slides himself. All the slides himself. I don't have staff who help me. And so when and so this, when, this, when the Indian Navy, when I tell the Indian Navy I need a helping hand, they normally tell me it's there at the end of your arm. So I so worry that I the slides get plagiarized, but I will be happy to put them into a PDF protected PDF format, format and then, format and then yeah, make it available. Does that uh, help? That was a comment from someone from the audience. Our next question is, from Mr. Vijay Nilikeni, and I'm going to read the question. For an effective operational deployment and successful outcome for the Indo-Pacific Integrated Quad Strategy, a high level of technology, communications, weapons integration is needed. Does this exist? India has Soviet-era ships, weapons, and protocols. Are there efforts underway for seamless integration? I want to, that, that's an honest question, and I would like to afford an equally honest, blunt answer. And the answer is an unequivocal yes. It's not something that is efforts are underway. India is the sinusure of all eyes because of an organization called WESI. This is the Weapons and Electrical Electronic Systems Engineering Establishment, and its job was to take diverse diverse sources of equipment, of uh, voltages, of uh, frequencies, and get them together. We aren't doing this today, that it is some work in progress. It is work that was done when INS Godavari first came out. At that point in time onwards, India is the global leader in being able to integrate what appears to be non-integratable. For example, Soviet supplies are 127 volts and they run at 53 or 57 hertz. Sometimes they run at even stranger hertz. 
stranger frequencies. And yet, WESI has developed a set, not one, a set of solutions to this. Let's take high-end stuff and not take interface boxes. When, we, when currently the Indian Navy operates on all its frontline combatants, it operates indigenously developed combat management suites. Combat management suites integrate weapon, sensor, human being, machinery, all of this put together. The equipment can come from Israel. It can be developed by India. It can be jointly developed by India and Israel, jointly developed by India and Russia, Soviet Union, erstwhile Soviet Union, erstwhile England, Great Britain, United Kingdom, whichever one you want to call them. All of these are stitched together. So I think that this is one area in which you should be resting sanguine that conditions, activities in India are ahead of everybody in the world by several orders of magnitude. I'll stop there. Thank you, Admiral Chauhan. The next question is from Yoga Jyotsna from Varanasi. Sir, can we be assured of this maritime policy continuing even after a possible change of government in Delhi? Are the Indian Navy and MOD uh, committed to these realities? What are the possible scenarios in that regard in case of change of government? Okay, first of all, okay, changes, first of all of changes of government are disruptive everywhere. Disruptive everywhere. The United States has seen how this happens frequently enough. Uh, we've seen massive changes of approach uh, depending on the administration in power, and India is no exception to this. The civil service obviously is meant to provide the continuity between political uh, turbulence or political vicissitude in, in, in terms of political winds. Your question is pointed in two points. One, is the Indian Navy committed to continuing these realities? The answer is an unequivocal yes. Will the Indian Navy continue to hold these thoughts? The answer is yes. The Ministry of Defense, as the integration between the Indian Navy and its Ministry of Defense increases, which is why Naval Headquarters is no longer called Naval Headquarters, and ever since Cargill Committee reports have been uh, actioned, it has been changed to integrated headquarters of the Ministry of Defense Navy. Now, for 10 years, the Ministry of Defense civilian bureaucrats dug in their heels and said, we are not going to share any part of this pie. And sophisticated but entirely fallacious arguments were uh, propagated towards this end. However, you do know that we now have a Department of Military Affairs. It has its own staff. For the first time, you are able to answer this question. You have a chief of the naval staff, no? Who is he chief? Which, who is the staff that he's chief of? When you say he's chief of army staff, which is the staff of which he is chief? And the answer is, whose staff is that? The answer is, that is the minister's staff. And now for the first time, you have a Department of Military Affairs. You have a full staff echelon called the Headquarters Integrated Defense Staff. They feed in, they develop the environmental roadmaps that India needs to go forward. And once these roadmaps are put in place, they move forward. What happens then? What, what are the, what are the uh, uh, probable scenarios? One, the Indian economy tanks. Disaster. Second, the Indian economy grows. Wonderful. Third, Indian think tanks stop thinking and start tanking. Disaster. Indian think tanks stop tanking and start thinking. Marvelous. Which of these will come true? I don't know. I, I'm an optimist, but uh, I'm also a realist, and I also recognize the impact that political. Uh, so what, what is it that we need to ensure ourselves against this? We need evangelists. We need simply this one word. We need evangelists. What we've got are either people who know how to talk but don't know what they talk. They're like music system speakers. Or we've got chaps who know stuff but can't talk. So we need to be able to nurture these. God doesn't give them to us. We, don't, we can't go to some mandir or the other and pray that Ram Chandra Ji will come down. We have to develop the skill. We have to nurture it. And if we can do this, then we can convince younger politicians. 
where do these politicians come from? We are not importing our government from Venezuela. We are growing our government from the people of India. And therefore, all of us have a duty to keep the people of India, the people of the world informed. The younger those people are, the better are your chances. That's what I wanted to say. Thank, That's you. What I wanted to say. Thank you, Admiral Johan. Now, shifting to a focus or the microscope on our adversary, supposing a similar hypothetical situation happens in China, and question is from Lakshman Kanduri. Now that the that Xi Jinping is hypothetically or supposedly out of power, would there be any change in your thinking about China? Or how okay. to okay. that's a very good question. That's a very good question. It's it is centered upon what you do, what you understand. I'm sure uh, that you do understand this. It's called the center of gravity analysis. At the strategic level, the center of gravity of China is the Communist Party of China, what the Americans call the Chinese Communist Party. They call it, they call it the Chinese Communist Party just to irritate the Chinese. The actual terminology is the Communist Party of China, CPC. Now, the CPC is well known to be the center of gravity of China. It is what keeps the present condition of China together. What has happened is that in China, I told you the core national interest of India was the economic, material, and societal well-being of the people of India. For the word India, you could substitute USA, you could substitute Australia, you could substitute France, anybody. But you cannot substitute, for example, an autocratic country, and particularly you cannot substitute China, because in China, the people of China have been conflated with the Communist Party of China. And now, when Xi Jinping came along, the effort made by him was to conflate the Ch Communist Party of China with Xi Jinping. That is a significant problem and a significant uh, strategic error for the following two, three reasons. One, if you did that and you killed everybody, see in life it's frequently said only half jokingly that it's not important to be right or wrong, it's important to have somebody to blame. And if you have ended up killing everybody whom you could have blamed for any foibles, any un unforeseen circumstances, any, uh, uh, any unintended consequences, then there's only you, baby. Now you are, therefore, the face of China. And when you sold the China dream, the China's, Chinese people believed it and attached their face to your face. Suddenly, if you decide that you are going to be removed from power, you're not going to get a third term. And I know that you're reading the memes that are coming out in the social media, which is, a, which is to be taken with very large bushels of salt. But anyway, so that's my view, and you have your own view, and I, I, I don't have any better locus standard than you. But if, the, if Xi Jinping was not to be there, would the party collapse right now? No, because Xi Jinping has not succeeded in entirely conflating the face of the Chinese Communist Party with the face of Xi Jinping. If he does that, then your question is valid. But at the moment, there is still quite a large distance. Will Xi Jinping's demise, departure, um, you know, removal from power change China? No. But if the Communist Party of China changes, then that will change China. Similarly, in the case of Pakistan, which is a more focused area, the civil, political, military elite of Pakistan keeps Pakistan as a coherent entity together. This is their strategic center of gravity. And our effort is to be able to remove this center of gravity and bring genuine, mark my adjective, genuine democracy back into Pakistan. The whole situation between India and Pakistan will change. Thank you. The next question is by Pranav, and the, I am going to read the question. Sir, do you think India should play a role in ensuring freedom of navigation and stability through the Taiwan Strait? If so, how should India do this? Okay, so do I believe okay, so that do I believe freedom that of navigation freedom operations, operations are, in fact, are in fact a good thing? A good thing. You know, the United States you know, the United does States freedom States of navigation operations based upon presidential decree. 
and uh, all the no news and noise that you hear about has been going on for years and years and years. It's not something new. It's just that our media has finally picked it up and uh, is playing it up. But your question is sharp, so let me let me make my answer sharp. Do I think that India should be seen? That means what strategic signaling ought we as India to be doing to China or for China? I think that we should be seen in the South China Sea. We are in fact being seen in the South China Sea. We should be not seen alone in the South China Sea. We must be seen with partners in the South China Sea. This is strategic signaling. It's quite different from asking me whether in a combat situation we ought to be in the South China Sea. I've already answered that, that you would be extraordinarily stupid if you were to be doing that. And there is no answer to stupid. Stupid is just stupid. If, if Russia forgets about how to handle its blue water combatants uh, in a confined area, then that is just stupid. And you can keep assigning different attributes to it but it is still just stupid. Signaling. When we do exercises with quad countries, even if we do them in the Persian Gulf, do you think that China is not, uh, not listening, not looking, not registering this? If it comes in their face, in their face, I mean in the American terminology, in your face, would that cause a loss of face to China? And is that in our interest? That is something that our people must think carefully about. So I think that we should be seen in the South China Sea. I am certainly not as convinced as you seem to be that we should be participating in freedom of navigation operations. But if we are seen in the South China Sea, it's automatic that we are looking at freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation operations also do not incorporate, you know, a reef, a reef, fiery cross reef or mischief reef, Reefs don't have any, they don't have any zones. They don't have a territorial sea or anything. So saying that I'm within 12 miles or not saying within 12 miles, I mean, either you have to admit that reefs have te territorial seas or you, if you feel that they don't have territorial seas, even if they are built up after that, they remain without maritime zones, then you're going 12 miles away, it doesn't make any difference. But be seen in the South China Sea, that is for sure. Be careful about how you're seen. And the Indian Navy is indeed operating, deploying, even as late as last month or last to last month in the South China Sea. I don't think these messages are going unheard or unregistered. Okay, there's a supplementary question by the same member of the audience, Pranav, uh, and he wants to know what is India's current capability in terms of being able to choke China's slots through the Malacca Strait or other areas. Okay, let me be quite clear let about the Malacca Strait is a strait used for international. It's an international strait used for navigation. It is not capable of being choked by anybody. That doesn't mean that we can't choke China's energy supplies. But your your conflation of these two terms and centering them geographically upon the Malacca Strait is incorrect. We don't need to go to the Strait of Malacca to do this. Where is China get? I told you that we get 67.5% of our oil from West Asia. How much does China get? If we are importing 4.556 million barrels of oil per day, China is currently importing 12 million barrels of oil per day. Of those 12 million barrels of oil per day, 80% is coming from West Asia. Why do I need to go all the way there? So is China importing oil from Angola? Yes. Where is Angolan oil moving from? From around the south of Africa, that Cape of Good Hope. Then if I wanted to develop the, and I do have the ability, not capability, not capacity, but both, that is the ability to address this particular oil, why do I need to go anywhere else? If I develop a 4,500 mile logistic chain enabling me to deploy carrier battle groups in and around the Cape of Good Hope, China to contest that has to develop carrier battle group capability over an 8,600 nautical mile logistic chain. At the moment, they can't leave the South China Sea with their carriers. And therefore, carrier operations 
are not about the carrier alone. This I have already sent an article of sufficient uh, uh, detail. But I also want to tell you that even if you take the carrier, when you deploy a carrier, you need to qualify, you need to deck qualify your pilots by day and by night. At night, you have to be able to have what is called diversionary airfields within 50 miles of your carrier. If you are operating in the Indian Ocean currently or in the Arabian Sea currently, where are your where are your bases? Where is your diversionary? And that is why Djibouti is so important. Not because Djibouti is a base. Djibouti is not a base. Djibouti is a place. A base is a place that you can defend in combat. How will China defend Djibouti in combat? The, the Turbat, Pasni, or Mara, that whole block, yeah, that is a base. But Djibouti and all, these are not bases. These are places. These are places from where, in times short of conflict, you have great advantage, surveillance, intelligence, this, that, and the other. In times of combat, no. Therefore, sir, in short, India's ability to choke Chinese energy lifelines is marked because they have to go through the Indian Ocean and they have to go through more than just the eastern choke points. They have to first get out of the state of Hormuz. Then people talk to me, but Gwadar, let me kill that issue. Uh, 250,000 deadweight ton VLCC requires and has a draft underwater of 36 meters. In 2021, Gwadar was 2020 December, Gwadar was dredged to 17 meters. This allows 70,000 deadweight ton ships to go alongside. So your question should have been, sir, who is keeping track of dredging? That would have been a good wise question. And that's what we should be doing, and that's what we are doing. I'll stop that. I'll stop that. Okay. Uh, the next question is that China does have a military base in Djibouti. Uh, does India have any bases outside India? It's a loaded question, but. Okay, I'll answer okay. it. I'll answer it. First of all, First of all let me once let again, me once again the, repeat myself. Repeat myself. A military, a base, military base is different, is from, different a place. from a place. A place, a place is something is which in a time short of conflict, short of conflict you, can you can utilize to enhance your reach, reach improve, your, improve surveillance, your surveillance, show greater, show greater presence, presence. All of that is, true. That is true. It is in times short, short of conflict. A military a base military is base a place, that, place is that is capable of being capable defended of in times of conflict. Of conflict. Djibouti, is, Djibouti currently is currently shared as a place, as a place by, France, by France, by the United States, the United States China, China, and if India wants India, India, wants India. So, these so are all these are all places. places. When you talk when about you talk about Diego Garcia, Diego for, Garcia example, for example, that is a, that military, is a military base military because, military because the United because States, States of America, States of America, America has the ability, to defend, the ability to defend it. When you talk about you a base about in base Japan, Japan of the USA, of the USA there's, there's a lot of echoes. Somebody needs to put his If you develop this base in the of the USA in Japan, it is a military base because Japan will defend it. If you deploy a force, a base in the Philippines by the USA, the Philippines and the USA will defend it. If you deploy a, a, a base in Eritrea, who is going to defend it? How will it be developed? How will it get defended? Therefore, if you are asking me this question within the paradigm of peace, where influence or shaping operations are required, then India has places that are available to it without necessarily following exactly the same model that is being followed by China. When we have those logistic support agreement 
agreements available, it means we can deploy forces at short notice with logistic support from those locations. That will give us the reach that we need. That will give us the surveillance we need. It will give us the enhanced presence we need. It will not. It will not solve the problem in conflict. That a sovereign power is involved. And when you have a military base, there are huge issues. There is status of forces agreements that have to be signed. Whose laws will apply inside the base? Your countries or that countries? There are hundreds of problems. And there are more than one way. You must, I only want to leave you with this one comment. There is always more than one way of skinning a cat. You do not have to bludgeon it to death every time. And so India has native intelligence that advises it as to how many alternative options are there to simply establishing a military base in an area that might be difficult for India to thereafter defend, even if the country concerned was to say, OK, I'll defend it along with you. So do we have places? Yes, we have places. Yes, we have but do we develop bases? Uh, we'll leave that alone. I think that was a very eloquent answer. Uh, we do not have any more questions from the audience, but the team CSA may have a couple of questions. And I'll give the first opportunity to my colleague, Mr. Pachori, if he has any questions to ask. Sir Pudaman. Do you have any questions to ask? You are muted. Ripudaman, you are I muted. don't have any question. Any question. Uh, Adityanji uh, and uh, Admiral uh, Chauhan, uh, uh, but it was, uh, uh, it was uh, amazing uh, and uh, very mesmerizing uh, presentation. Uh, there was a lot to learn from it. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, I am no longer taking questions from the audience because we have to conclude the session. Uh, Admiral Chauhan, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, neither of the audience nor your presentation alluded to it. Uh, there was a recent controversy about China's spy ship. Yuan Yuan Wang Five uh, being stationed in Hamantota port in Sri Lanka, and there were some sensitivities on part of India involved. And it is alleged or stated that China was not able to do what it purported to do by use of the spy ship Yuan Wang Five. Any comments from you on that issue? Yes. Uh, okay, so there's going to be a lot of unhappiness, I think, with my answer. First of all, the Yuan Wang is a telemetry and space tracking ship. It does not represent a strength of China. It represents a huge vulnerability. The reason is that when you deploy space-based assets, whether they are satellites or they are intercontinental ballistic missiles, they need to be tracked and corrections have to be continuously or continually, if not continuously provided. These space tracking, this space tracking and telemetry requires large assets to be created on ground. And just like a satellite requires a ground station, the, the ground station requires ground. And so you need ground. When you do not have ground, then you try to keep the whole thing mobile. And you use space tracking and telemetry ships, not because that's your option of choice, but that is forced upon you from lack of available ground that you can defend. There is a concept called marking which every naval officer of any country is aware, where you position your asset in a manner that will be able to, at zero or short notice, take out the adversary's asset. 
if you have a ship nothing stops your adversary or adversaries from marking you utilizing a number of platforms whether they are surface or they are subsurface what then was the big I, what was the big hullabaloo about the yuan wang class ship when she entered remember china has multiple of these one is on either side of the coast of south africa one on the atlantic ocean side one in the uh, indian ocean side one of them is operating off the south pacific because as i said does india need that yeah so what do we do we capitalize upon our good offices in countries that are of consequence to us which is you know that we we developed uh, uh, space facilities in specific areas in the south southern pacific ocean which is what we needed and we succeeded now if they succeed in the solomons etc cetera, etc cetera, maybe but right now they don't therefore the yuan wang class ship like any other class of ship has got electronic warfare facilities but every ship has that every single type of ship so the yuan wang class is actually a as i said it's a space and telemetry space tracking and telemetry ship the memes that went around on the internet about the manner in which we downloaded data etc cetera, etc cetera. these i am afraid are um, uh, generated by some for some titillation rather than some for, for some fact so is it problematic for india that china should be using humban tota for its quasi military vessels yes hugely problematic should we have made a noise even more than we did but was it that they were by virtue of being present able to eavesdrop on indian activity electronic activity that as i said can be done by any ship any ship you don't need to have an announced vessel to say that okay i'm here and i'm going to do a ship is a large vessel you can put electronic equipment on it and you need you need sensors you need uh, satellites now you, i mean not satellites you need uh, um antennae and those antennae if they are all dish antennae and they are based for space then that's what they're doing does that mean they're only tracking them their own assets no no that doesn't mean that so is that being utilized or could it be utilized to track other objects in space most certainly what about our objects in space most certainly should we be upset most certainly but but that really is what i want is what i want like all good things every activity has to come to an end it was a highly educative uh discussion transfer of knowledge to our audience and i must say that we are very delighted with admiral johan coming back again and my hope is that he will every year he'll continue to come on the csa platform to educate and inform us on strategic issues pertaining to india's you know rise and challenges i am highly thankful to him i am also thankful to our audience members who on a saturday morning in united states and saturday evening took one and a half hour of their time from weekend to participate in somewhat esoteric and dry subjects like geopolitics so thanks to the audience and lastly i am thankful to the team csa mr pachauri and mr bhandari who helped me on the background to arrange these kind of programs we shall meet again on october 8th when we have a round table discussion and i am going to announce the topic for that round table discussion and that is asymmetric warfares the lessons learned from the battle of haldi ghati so we will have a very live and interesting uh, discussion on a concept of asymmetric warfare so till that time thank you
and we are going to close this session. Namaskar to everyone, especially Admiral Chauhan. Thank you so much. Thank you so time. much. Good night. Or good day to the good rest of you. Good day to the rest of you. Okay.